Um, I have such gratitude to you, such hakarat tov, and, and God should bless you and, and your wonderful family for all the mm -hmm. amazing work that you do for Klai Yisrael and for the entire world, the publishing and, and uh, just bringing so much light of, of Torah into the world. God bless you. So here we are. It's, uh, it's Gimel Elul. It's the 85th yard site of uh, Harav, uh, Avraham Yitzchak HaKohen Kok, Zecher Tzadik Levracha. And um, I'm just overwhelmed, honestly. The the uh, the responsibility uh, to say anything about such a, 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 a neshama, such a soul, and and uh, I can't possibly do justice. But uh, as I said, uh, let let's uh, share some teachings of Harav and. Uh, and bask in the uh, in the presence, lehanot uh, miziv, the presence of Harav Zatzal. Starting uh, Rosh Chodesh Elul through Yom Kippur is a period of forty days, and uh, these forty days are all about teshuvah. And that's a term that's going to be thrown at us time and time again, teshuva, which simply means return. Now the question is, return to whom? Return to what? So that's what we're going to try to figure out in the time that we have to share together. Obviously, the answer to the question is, Return to God. Veshavta uh, Hashem Elokecha. Return to the Lord your God. That's in the uh, Parshat Nitzavim. Or as Hoshea stated, it Shuvah Yisrael Ad Hashem Elokecha. And uh, from that we have uh, Shabbat Shuvah. You know the Shabbat between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is called Shabbat Shuvah. But it's taken from the, the first word of, of the Haftarah, which is Hoshea, Shuva Yisrael Adashem Elokecha, return Israel to the Lord your God. So that's a, a very simple, basic response to the question uh, to whom to return, to return to God. But that doesn't really tell us where we're getting this word Teshuva from. What is the first? original occurrence of the word Teshuvah. And before Rav Kook, there was a great Sephardic sage who lived in Serbia. And his name was Rav Yuda Chai Alkali. You may have heard of him. And he points out something extremely important, that this word Teshuvah first occurs in the, the book of Samuel, Shmuel Hanabi. And it describes how the prophet Samuel is what we would call today a circuit judge. He would travel, he would traverse the entire land of Israel, judging the people wherever he went. And once a year, he would return back home to his home, which is Ramah. You may know in Yushalayim there's a neighborhood of Ramot, and above that is Nabi Samuel. And that's the resting place of Shmuel Hanavi. And the Pasuk says, Uteshuvato haramata, Hisham Beito. His return, his teshuva was to Ramah because there was his house. And this great Sephardic sage, Rav Yudha Chayal Kalai, is conveying a very important message that for us Jews, part and parcel of the process of Teshuvah is to return to our home, to our geographical home, which is Eretz Yisrael. Now, the Baal HaYilula, Rav Kook, as you may know, wrote an amazing work, Orota Teshuvah, 
Actually, it was put together, it was compiled, it was edited by my teacher of Sviuda Kohen Cook, who was the Ben Yachi, was the only son of the, of the Vav. And uh, during Rav Cook's absence in America, 1924, Rav Cook spent a whole year in the United States fundraising. During his absence, Rav Sviuda created this phenomenal work, which we all love so much, Orot HaTeshuvah, The Lights of Teshuvah, by piecing together various shtiklach, various entries in his father's uh, spiritual journals. And it has become a classic. Many people study this work of Rav Kook, Orot HaTeshuvah, and I'll share with you a little secret. Rav Kook himself used to study it during Chodesh Elul. Not that he was uh, a narcissist or an egomaniac, but he said, when I read it, I understand better what Teshuvah is all about. And I imagine that he also relived all of the, the lights, the illuminations, the orot, the ha'arot that were contained in that book. And when I was very young, about 25 years old, I met Rav Tzviuda for the first time in his home in Yerushalayim. And uh, I presented him with an essay that I had written. It was a, uh, an analysis of Orot HaTshuvah. And it's since been published. It's entitled, It's Donot Nasot Kizachuyot B'Mishmato Shel Harav Kuk. And Rav Tzviuda read it and loved it. He had one caveat. He told me, please take out the section on Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche. But other than that, he green-lighted it. He gave it the thumbs up. And as I said, it, it has been published uh, a few times over. So what I'm going to try to do with, uh, with us now is to give you some of the highlights of my perception, my understanding of Orot HaTshuva. I'm not going to give you the whole essay, but I'll, I'll give you some of the central themes, the central motifs. Just let me have a little Aimayim uh, the Torah. Reading Orot Chuva, the thought occurred to me that it could be boiled down to two themes, and I'm going to call them Teshuvah Atzmit and Teshuvah Olamit. One is return to yourself, and the other is return to the world, the cosmos, the universe. And the two are not mutually exclusive, as we'll see. They actually reinforce one another. They're mutually complementary. They complement one another. And uh, I like to give two uh, examples of, of how to picture this, how to conceptualize how the, the, the two processes of teshuva atzmit and teshuva ulamit uh, intertwine. One is, um, if you're familiar with the Mobius strip, you take a strip of paper and you twist it and you think you're going in and you're actually coming out. The other image I would like to share with you are these staircases of Escher. You know, this, uh, this Dutch artist, uh, Escher, E-S-C-H-E-R. And again, you might think you're, you're on a, a down staircase and lo and behold, it's a, an up staircase. So that's the paradox that runs through Orota Chuva. The, the deeper you go into yourself, the broader your horizon, the broader your compass. And I'd like to throw at you uh, a little Kabbalistic jargon. In Kabbalah, we talk about or panimi, the, the inner light, versus or makif, the surrounding light. So again, you go, deeper into yourself, you explore your, your inner recesses, you get in touch with your with your inwardness, and 
by doing so, at the same time, simultaneously, you're broadening your horizon and your ability for outreach to touch others out there in the, in the big world. So the, the, the microcosm and the macrocosm, uh, as in these Asherian staircases, uh, are indivisible. You're going to see this portrayed very vividly in the book of Jonah. And we Jews are very fond of the prophet Jonah. How do I know that? Because on Yom Kippurim, which is the 40th day, the culmination of this whole spiritual journey, which we started Rosh Chodesh Elul a couple of days ago, at Mincha, we read Maftir Yonah. And I remember from my childhood, uh, Maftir Yena, there would be stiff competition in the synagogue, bidding for the, the, the zhut, the privilege, who's going to have that amazing schia to read Maftir Yena. That's the, the Lithuanian uh, pronunciation. So let's study the book of Jonah. And before we launch on this sea voyage, uh, let me share with you something from a letter of Rav Cook that he wrote from Yafo. You know, Rav Cook, before he became the Rav of Yushalayim, he was a Rav in Yafo, Jaffa. Tel, today it's Yafo, Tel Aviv, uh, from 1904 to 1914. And uh, those might have been the most creative years of uh, Rav Zetzal, Kufat Yafo. This is a letter, you can find it, it's in Igrot Raya in volume one, it's on page 35. And Rav Kook is saying how every place in Eretz Yisrael has a, a different spiritual dimension. And then he speaks about his own place where he was residing, Yafo. And this is what he writes, he quotes this Kabbalistic work by Rabbi Avram Azulai, Chesed Lavraham, that each place in the Holy Land has a, a, a dimension, a spiritual dimension. So you have to love every every place in Eretz Yisrael. And he says that there were tzaddikim who would make a point to, to travel throughout the land because they, they wanted to, to experience the, the Kedusha in, in, in each Dalet Amot, in each four cubits uh, throughout the land. And now he says, Lemashal po ir HaKodesh Yafo. He says, for example, here in, in my city of Yafo, Yesh Lechabev, we have to love it, because who was here? The prophet Jonah. So we know the story of Jonah uh, receives a prophecy from God. He has to go to the city of Nineveh, and uh, we'll talk a little about that city of Nineveh. But uh, his point of departure is the port of Jaffa, of Yaffa. That's all in the book. Rav Kook didn't make that up. But what Rav Kook is telling us as a, as a Kabbalist, as a mystic, is he says, Shebevadai kama v'chama tikunin hishrish v'halichato lidorot. Certainly many tikunim, everybody knows the word tikun, right? Tikun olam. Many tikunim, many spiritual corrections, Hishrish Yonah, Yonah implanted in this place of Yafo many, many tikkunim. Bahalichato lidorot, Bahalichato, when he embarked on his voyage, lidorot. And these, these tikkunim that were set in place by Yonah Hanavi, they remain here in this place, Yafo lidorot. Now, anybody who knows anything about Rav Kook knows that he was a great machzir b'tshuva. He was someone who was trying to bring others close to God. People who were very far away, 
who are very alienated, very turned off, uh, OTD, whatever you want to call them, Rav Cook would lovingly embrace them and bring them back. And perhaps, perhaps he identified with Yonah Hanavi because that was the mission of Yonah Hanavi. That's what we know about Yonah Hanavi. He was sent on a mission to go to this distant city of Nineveh, which was the capital of, uh, they called Neo-Assyria. It was a great city. At the end of the book of Yonah, it tells you uh, 120,000 inhabitants, which today, by today's standards is a small city, but uh, in those days it was probably the largest city around. And uh, the people were sinful, and God tells Yonah, I want you to go there and prevail upon the inhabitants of Yonah to do teshuva. So I'm thinking, Rav Cook is writing how Yonah Hanavi implanted in this place of Yaffa, where Rav Cook just happens to reside, Kama Vachama Tikunim, many spiritual corrections, and that these remain the Dorot. They're still there in Rav Cook's time. Think about that. Now, let's go back to our model, which as I said is first we go inward and then we go outward. And that's what we're going to see in the story of Yonah. Rav Noor, can I just interrupt for- the story. Rav Noor, can I just interrupt for a second? I apologize. A few people, um, are meant are asking uh, questions. So I just want to tell the group that it's wonderful that people are asking questions. Do you want to take questions now, or should we save them? No, the let, let's leave that at the end. Okay. Okay. okay thank you very much. Okay. I, I you know I can't interrupt this uh, sea voyage in, in the middle. So um, yes. Yeah, so uh, Yonah Navi embarks on the ship, and uh, as we all know, it's a whale of a story. And uh, there's a sea, a sea storm, a sea tempest, and uh, Yonah is thrown overboard. And he now spends the next three days in the belly of the, the big fish, whether it's a whale or whatever. What is he doing there for three days? It's a time of introspection. He's in isolation, he's in the bidud, gitbodidut. It's a time of hitaharut, of hizakikut, of purification, of catharsis. And he emerges after three days and he continues on his mission to Nineveh. And the message that he delivers is, uh, is cryptic. I'll read you the words. In another 40 days, Nineveh will be overturned. Now, at the time that Yonah Hanavi uttered the words, he thought it means that Nineveh will be destroyed. But, as the Chazal point out, out to us, and this is in Masechet Sanhedrin, Daf Peitet, and Mubet, it's what we call Tarte Mashma. It's a deliberately ambiguous message. And it has two senses. And as I said at the time, Chashaval Lera'a, Yonah Hanavi thought that that's it. That's going to be the end of the city of Yonah. It will be destroyed, like Stone, Bamora, and so many others. Eventually, we find out that the divine intent is something totally different. Nefechet turned in the sense of Teshuva. The people will return and there will be a mafecha ruchanit. It won't be destructive, this uh, revolution. It'll be a spiritual revolution where 
their hearts will open to God and they'll do Teshuvah. So we're seeing this model in action. As I said, there's first the Orpnimi and then there are Makif, there's first the Teshuvah Atzmit, where Yona has to get in touch with his inner self his inner recesses by, by dwelling in the inner recesses of the, of the well, the fish. And after he's done that, and only after that, is he capable, is he qualified, is he in a position to preach to others, to prevail upon others to do teshuvah. So first there's the teshuvah atzmit, and then there's the teshuvah olamit. And Reish Lakish in the Talmud, expressed it by saying, and it's very famous, this saying, Kishot atzmacha, v'chakach kishot acherim. First, you have to fix yourself before you fix others. You have to do your own tikkun, tikkunin, before you do tikkunin for others. Now, we're coming from a, a period of uh, a pandemic, a global pandemic, COVID-19. People have been in isolation, in bidud for months. If you want to use this image, we've all been, we've all been in the belly of the well, not for three days, for three months and, and, and more. And we're coming out of it now. And the, the world that we come to cannot be the world that we went into. It has to be different. And obviously Teshuvah is not only for the Jewish people. I know there's a whole learned discussion. I don't, my bit, I don't want, I don't want to go into that, but Pishutosha Mikra, let's stick to the, the Tanakh, to the Bible. The book of Jonah is a story of how a, a non-Jewish city of Nineveh does Teshuvah and is saved. And by the way, uh, before uh, the Shior, I, I, I googled Nineveh. And I found out something very interesting. Uh, today, it would be adjacent to Mosul, Iraq, uh, the ruins of Nineveh. Unfortunately, a lot of them were destroyed uh, by ISIS. But uh, there was a, a site there called Tel Nabi Yunus. Okay. Uh, that's in Arabic. Uh, Nabi Yunus is uh, Yonah Hanavi. So Yonah Hanavi uh, left uh, an imprint uh, at his point of departure in Yafo, Allah Rav Kook, but he also left footsteps. He left an imprint at his point of arrival in Nineveh, Lidorot. So as I said, We've got to make it a better world. And I, I want to share with you something. And anyone who knows me knows that I stay as far away from politics as, as humanly possible. What we need is as I said, the key word is nefechet, mapecha. We need a revolution, but what kind of revolution? We don't need a capitalist revolution. We don't need a communist revolution because capitalism and communism are two sides of the same coin, which is materialism. They're both based on a materialist conception of the universe. What we need is mapecha ruchanit, revolutia ruchanit. We need a spiritual revolution because as long as God is absent from this equation we're not going anywhere we're just in a time loop 
Okay, we keep trading off capitalism against communism. It's a time loop. It, it's uh, what my professor of philosophy called an infinite regress. We don't go anywhere with that. So Adim Bamakom, we're just treading in place. The way to, to, to break through and to break out is we need, we need God. Now, whether you call God, God, I actually prefer the term Ein Sof, which is a Kabbalistic term. Um, and when you study Kabbalah deeply, you find out that even that is insufficient, uh, even Ein Sof. But that's the best the Mekubalim were able to come up with is Ein Sof, the infinite. It's a spiritual dimension. So I, I bless all of us that we should all be zocher to teshuvah, to return, and it should be both teshuvah atzmit, we should get in touch with our, our true inner self, our pnimiut, our pnimi, and we should also be zocher to teshuvah olamit, to reach out, Alec is doing a wonderful job of reaching out to the world through his medium of, 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 uh, of publishing. And each of us are given God-given talents, and we should use our kohot hanefesh, we should use these gifts to reach out, to make it a, a, a world in which we will experience the, the orot chuva. This is Rav Cook's spiritual revolution. And uh, as I'm saying today, it's not only for Am Yisrael, and Halavai Am Yisrael would do Teshuvah in, in the, the true authentic sense, but it's not restricted to Am Yisrael. It's not about Am Yisrael. It's about the whole world. It's, it's about Nineveh. And um, the Pasuk in Yeshayahu says, Beshuvah v'nachat tivasheun. And this is a, a pasuk that Rav Kook quotes time and time again. With return and with pleasantness, you will be saved. So I want to wish everyone a ktiva v'chatima tova la'alta l'chayim v'sifran shot tzadikim k'murim. So I'm now turning it back to Rabbi Alec Goldstein. Rav Nor it's a pleasure to, to hear your Torah and to hear you address us all. Um, I know that we are getting some questions, so I want to open it up for Q&A in a minute. Um, I do want to mention uh, that um, at Kodesh Press, uh, as was mentioned before, we are very proud to have published two of Rabbi Noor's books on Rav Kook. Um, the first one is uh, When God Becomes History, the historical essays of Rav Kook, which was published about four or five years ago. I think there's a little bit of a glare, um, which, so I'm not sure if people can see it. Oh, well, oh, 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 oh. This, 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 <laughs> This is, uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a, isn't there something about the lights being, sometimes the light is so bright that it's blinding and we need to dim it. So <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if this is better. I'm actually going to stop the recording now.